Hello. Um, <laughs> I'm going to tip myself a little timer here so I keep more or less on track. Uh, this was the advertised topic, and, and that's actually what we're going to do. I'm going to talk about uh, why I am such a big fan of usability testing and why I think everybody should be doing it. Now, can you raise your hand in the back row if you can hear me? If you can hear me, raise your hands. Okay, that's good. If it gets too quiet, let me know. I have a knob here I can turn. Uh, and I'm not afraid to use it, as we like to say. <laughs> All right. Uh, yes, uh, awareness now. Um, unfortunately, uh, I know this is what my slides should be like. They should just be big, evocative photos, one slide, one photo per slide, and then I should talk as though I'm talking extemporaneously based on the photos and all that stuff. But unfortunately, that's not, not me. Uh, I am not the big, evocative photos guy. And the sad part is I'm not even sorry about it. Uh, <laughs> I'm unrepentant. Um, so it's bullets, lots of bullets, uh, and uh, a template straight out of Office 2004. Um, but, again, can you read the slide from the back of the room? Raise your hand if you can read the slide from the room. Yeah, so, okay. I go to a lot of usability conferences, and the most distressing thing to me about going to usability conferences is when I'm sitting in a presentation and there are slides that are like gray on gray type, small gray on gray type, and I'm sitting in the second row and I can't read them. I find that distressing. All right, so. Me, uh, I am husband and father. This is my wife looking at the crane from the balcony of our... Uh, lovely room at the at-home hotel is not quite right. It's, it's just a block away, and it's the fourth floor of an office building that has like 10, um, you know, uh, studios in it with kitchens and <laughs> dryer, washers and dryers. Um, it's very cool, and it has balcony looking out over construction. This is my son, <laughs> um, who's 25 and actually is, is taking up the family business. He's going into UX, which shocked me. Um, the raccoon in the corner is probably photoshopped because this was on a ferry. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we live just outside of Boston. This is our house. Um, ordinarily, there's not a mermaid in the front yard, but my wife was having a wedding shower for her niece. On the other hand, sometimes the front yard looks like this. Two, two winters ago, we had 110 inches of snow all within 30 days, all within. So we had a record winter snowfall within 30 days <laughs> for the whole winter. Um, and I, then, then there was this big co contest to see uh, on what date the final pile of snow that they had removed was finally gonna melt, and it didn't melt. The snow was in February, it didn't melt until July, the last of the snow, so. Anyway, but don't feel sorry for us. It's a very nice city, and it doesn't snow that much every winter. Uh, I've been a usability consultant, now I am, getting a usability consultant for um, 25 years, maybe, maybe even more. Uh, my so-called company is Advanced Common Sense, but it's really just me and a couple of well-placed mirrors. It's a one-person company. What they call in the states a DBA, doing business as. So I've been doing business as Advanced Common Sense. And uh, even though we're uh, just one person, uh, we actually have a trademarked corporate motto, it's not rocket surgery, which came in handy when I needed a title for my second book because it was hard to come up with a title after. The first one worked really well, so it was hard to come up with a title. Um, and the, 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 that um, motto reflects the fact that uh, what I do isn't that easy, isn't that hard, sorry, isn't that hard? <laughs> sorry, Freudian slip there. Um, in fact, I think my son decided to take up the business because he's, his uh, office when he was growing up was right outside my office and I think he saw that I wasn't doing any real work. Um, so, uh, but, but I do believe that what I do is really not that hard to do and that anybody who's in this business of ours, this digital world, who's, who's creating stuff, should be doing a fair amount of what I do for themselves. So they should be v validating the usability of the stuff that they're creating themselves and that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to say may sound familiar because it really is common sense and that's the thing about common sense as soon as you hear it you say oh I knew that but it's always good to be reminded of it I feel like my job a lot of the time is reminding people of things that they already know and there's this cartoon from the New Yorker from a couple of years ago uh, of the flight attendant holding up the seatbelt and the passenger saying sweet mother of God for some reason that oh, I always identify really with this cartoon. It's like, well, that's my job. 
So, so first, help me calibrate. Um, how many people have read some edition of Don't Make Me Think? Whoa, geez. Okay, three quarters, easily. Great. Um, uh, how many people have read Rocket Surgery Made Easy? Even, wow, that's pretty good. That's like 30%. 30, 30%. That's, that's about the right ratio. It's a good ratio. Okay. I never expected everybody who read Don't Make Me Think to read Rocket Surgery Made Easy. And I was thinking of it kind of like as the, the kid who goes to the same high school as his older brother who was on the football team, you know. It's like, <laughs> he's never going to quite live up to it, but does, does, does what he needs to do. So I, 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 I like rocket surgery a lot. All right. So you're probably wondering why I asked you here. Well, what I want, really want to do is try and convince you that um, usability testing is one of the best ways to improve the quality of what, the stuff you're creating. Okay, which I believe it is. I think it's one of the best and most efficient and effective ways to improve the quality of anything that you're designing that people are going to use. Um, and I'd also like to convince you that it's much easier than you think, so you really can do it yourself, and that you should be doing it routinely. So that's my objective. So how we're going to spend this time, first I'm going to talk a little bit about why I do usability testing, why I'm so enthusiastic about it, and then I'm going to do a live demo test. I'm going to ask for a volunteer, and I'm going to show you how I think you should be doing demo the usability tests, which is very simple. There's nothing to it. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the six maxims from the rocket surgery book. I tried to pull out, I, I usually learn like three things from a book, if I'm lucky. Um, so I, there were like six things in rocket surgery that I thought was really important for people. I would really be happy if most people who read the book ended up kind of remembering these things. So I pulled them out and made them into maxims. So we're going to talk very quickly about them. And then we're going to try and do as, many, as much question and answer as we can. So hopefully 30 minutes, maybe at least 20. All right, so another show of hands. Your experience with usability testing. So the first one of these, which is true for, wait, no, this is, this is in the wrong order somehow. Okay, you, you've, you've, obs you've observed tests. You observed tests, okay. Um, you actually conducted tests yourself? You were the facilitator? Whoa, what goes on in this town? Jeez. <laughs> Okay, well that's great. Um, all right, uh, then here's the essay question. I'd like maybe two or three people to answer this and shout really loud when you do. Um, if your team doesn't do routine usability testing routinely, like on a regular schedule often, many times during the course of development of, of a product, um, why do you think that is? What are the reasons for not doing it more often or for not, not, do, or for not doing it at all if you don't do it at all? Somebody, yes, right there. Stand up and shout. <laughs> Finding users. Finding users can be difficult. Okay, that's very common. Common. Yes. Uh, okay, customers will freak out. Okay, that's in, that's interesting too. Yeah. Ignorance of the value of it. Ignorance of the value of testing. Okay, generally speaking. Yes. It's going to cost more. It's going to cost more. You're going to have to charge the client more, or you're going to have to. Okay, fixing. Okay, so fixing the problems. You, fixing the problems that you find is 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 gonna is gonna cost more. Um, okay, one more. Yes. Time constraints. Okay, and which which kind of time are we talking about? Are we talking about not having enough time to do it, or the fact that doing it is going to slow the process down, or both? Uh, probably both. Probably both. Okay. Yeah, there are those two different kinds of of time constraints that 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 keep people from doing testing. All right. So first. What, what is this usability stuff? Well, for me, it's, it's just an attribute of good design. It's, it's hard to come up with more than that. And I, I have a definition of it for myself, uh, that this, this attribute, something has this attribute of usability if a person of average or even below average ability and experience, i.e. almost anybody who has a reason to use it, can figure out how to use it for its intended purpose. And then the one that I like best, which is without it being more trouble than it's worth because very often something may be hard to use, but if you really need to use it, then it may be worth the trouble. So I, I'm sure all of us have struggled really hard to use something that's hard to use, but it was the sole source to get the information we needed or it was the only, you know, it was our bank and we, it wasn't worth the effort of changing banks uh, to, to get around it. So, so that, that constraint comes into it a lot. It has to be, not be more trouble than it's worth. So, uh, these usability problems, there are a lot of usability problems out there. There are usability problems everywhere. Uh, one of my favorites is, uh, you've probably seen one of these, these coffee makers. 
I've seen, I saw a, a, a brilliant CEO and one of the, one of the smartest and nicest tech guys that I know of spend 10 minutes trying to figure out how to use his company's new coffee maker to make me a cup of coffee. So uh, we all know them. Sometimes they're not, they, you know, they don't get in our way that much. They just slow us down. So um, lately I see this more and more where it comes back and I enter an address and it comes back and says, is that what you really meant? So here, for instance, I often find that I'm not sure whether it's telling me that it doesn't like the fact that I didn't capitalize my address or it doesn't like the fact that I spelled out the word road. Uh, but I, you know, I, I, have to, I, I kind of have to figure out what they meant just to make sure that it's not going to get delivered to somebody you know, someplace else. I also love these, the, the um, embossed low contrast labels on, on manufactured objects. So like these were creamers, you know, cream and skim milk and, and whatever, and they were impossible to read. They were really cool. Sometimes just the wording. This is every time I go to, to go away on vacation or a business trip, um, I suspend home delivery of the New York Times. And so I now know how to find the right page in the New York Times website, which has taken some getting used to, because it's not always easy to get there. But now I can do that routinely. But I find that every time, once I get there, I'm brought up a little short by these two fields. So even though they're nicely done, and it's going to pop up a calendar and ask me to choose the suspend on date, does that mean the first day it's not going to get delivered? Or, or the day before, when it's going to really stop? So I, 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 you know, I kind of usually know really how to answer it, um, but I'm not 100% certain. But, but, uh, but again, the worst case is a newspaper is going to be lying on my lawn or I'm not going to get the newspaper one day. So it's not, it's, you know, it's not, we're not doing nuclear power plant controls here. It's really not a big deal. Sometimes they just cause us anxiety. This is a, a guy in the, in the States called Louis, anybody know who Louis C.K. is? Louis C.K.? I love Louis C.K. Louis C.K. is fabulous. Um, this was a thing that he did where uh, they were looking at parking signs uh, and they were looking at this one that said parking permit at any time after midnight. And I'll have to read you this text. Is, is it after midnight right now or is it before? And it's before midnight right now. Yeah, but it's also after. <laughs> and uh, this, was, this was great because we, you know, many cities uh, in the States, we have these, these, these trees full of uh, parking signs that are sometimes contradictory uh, and often just unclear. And somebody actually came up with this kind of a proposal for a uniform method for signage on the right. Um, but you know it's not going to happen because there are so many legacy signs out there. But it's a great idea. Um, sometimes th th these usability problems are just really annoying. Like here, I was trying to, what was I trying to do? Oh, I know, I was trying to do something with JetBlue. And, um, and so it, I, 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 I think I was using it on, the, on my phone or something, and I didn't want to bother doing much typing, so I just tried typing one letter from my first name, and it came up and said first name should be between two and 20, 25 characters. So I figured, all right, I'll just add, I'll add a numeral after it. And I did two, and it said first name format is invalid. So I did what we all do, which is I made up a name. <laughs> and I don't, I don't know if any of you have ever seen the Saturday Night Live skit where, where uh, uh, that's a, a parody of Jeopardy where, where uh, uh, what's his name, what's the actor's name? Burt Reynolds um, signs himself in as Turd Ferguson, so it's become kind of popular. All right, uh, sometimes they just scare us off. I was trying to do something on uh, Google+, Plus. I think it was just trying to read something somebody had written or something on Google+, Plus. and Google+, Plus wanted me to give it all kinds of powers. Uh, it wanted uh, to know, not only know my basic in profile info, but include people in circles that are not public on your profile, um, and uh, allow people in those circles to know that I've signed into this app with Google, view my email address. The most puzzling one was manage my calendar. I just wanted to read something. <laughs> Why is Google asking me to manage my calendar? All right, and then sometimes they grind us to a halt. This one's specified file does not exist. Click retry to read from the same location. To create a new version according to the current backup scheme, click ignore. My options are retry, ignore, or cancel. <laughs> How long would you spend puzzling over that one? I was just trying to do a backup, for heaven's sake. And this is actually in said hotel room at, at home. The, one of the views of it, we're halfway through our trip, and what I liked about it uh, when I, when I um, it, it chose it was that it had a washer dryer. So I thought, well, we, can, we don't have to take as many clothes. We can do wash that way through. Um, but it, it turned out that the, 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 the dryer 
didn't want to dry. It washed great, but it could like pretend that it was drying clothes for an hour, and they'd still be soaking wet. Um, and obviously, there was no way to figure out figure it out from any of these controls. Even those people who run the place had posted very nice photograph of instructions, whatever. So I went online and searched uh, for the manual for this dryer. Uh, and after getting through those hateful people who put up all those sites where it looks like you're going to get the manual for your thing, but instead they're asking you to download their software that will download the manual so that they can then steal your computer or your identity or whatever. Um, but I did find one, and I found the section on drying, and I found the thing that I said just to press the high dry, high dry button, F, and then I actually managed to find an illustration, the F, and it actually worked. So, you know, I mean, we do amazing stuff now. I mean, we've been walking around Australia and, and now New Zealand, and I'm thinking, you know, 15 years ago, I would have been carrying big, thick guidebooks that I only needed a small number of pages from, and I've been folding and unfolding maps all day, you know, and just all this stuff that, that works so wonderfully. So if you're interested in usability problems in general, I highly recommend it if you haven't read The Design of Everyday Things by Don Norman. It's a nice thin book, and it's, well, he wrote it back in 1987. It's still relevant. He talks a lot about. People say you'll never look at um, door handles uh, or shower controls or elevator con elevator controls the same way again. Those are what he uses for examples, and they're really fabulous. And we ran. I ran into this elevator recently, <laughs> where the round buttons the round buttons were there, and they were nicely labeled. And for some reason, they had put labels next to them that were round. And that looked exactly like the buttons, very confusing. All right. On the brighter side, though, uh, there's a lot of stuff that's done really well. I always think Amazon's done amazingly well. I l live on Amazon Prime and read Amazon reviews all the time. And now they added questions and answers. So you can actually say, will this work with my model, blah, blah, blah. And somebody who has one will answer it. Comparison charts. Um, Uber obviously works fabulously well, although uh, if Uber works fabulously well. I'm not sure about the how I feel about Uber in general for a number of reasons, but, but it does, you got to admit, it does work well. They sort of started late, so web app, so uh, mobile applications were, you know, kind of fully formed, so they started right with a good base to start on and just did an amazing job of making something incredibly convenient that had not been convenient at all. So they, they get really good marks on usability, whether their ethics are questionable or not. Um, my, own, my only disappointment here has been that you don't have open table. Anybody know what open table is? Yeah, open table. I was surprised. I was shocked that open table worked in Australia, but it's not here yet. Uh, uh, at least it doesn't seem to be. Um, I was, you know, searching for this, and it came up and said no, no restaurants found in, in um, Wellington first and then Queenstown. Uh, it's fabulous. You can basically just. It'll show you what, what the local restaurants are. It, it'll show you what reservations are available, like around the time that you want, rather than you having to poke and say, well, give me a reservation at this time. No. Give me a reservation at this time. No. Um, and uh, you can get a res you make a reservation in seconds. So look forward to it showing up here. So why usability testing? Well, um, a long time ago, when I first started writing Don't Make Me Think, I'd been consulting for 15 years at that point, and uh, I realized that uh, I had, every time I was brought in as a consultant, that part of the reason why I was brought in as a consultant was because this same discussion had been going on for a long time about how to handle the interface, and so they decided we'll bring in an outside expert. And so I was the outside expert. So I made, I, I put in the form of a comic, you know, don't make me think, there's the usual cast of characters, project manager, developer, designer, guy from marketing. Um, the designer tries to get the ball rolling and makes a suggestion about how to handle this part of the interface. Let's try it, try a pull down menu. But the developer comes back with a personal opinion disguised as fact, which is very common in these conversations. Uh, nobody likes that stuff. And, but, the, but the designer's no fool, and she knows that's what it is, so she comes back with one of her own. Uh, the marketing person knows that in the world of marketing, there is this thing called market research, and that if you do well-formed market research, you can actually find the answers to marketing questions, like you could find out how many people will pay more for a certain feature. Uh, 
And so he hopes that maybe this same approach can be taken to this problem. The problem is that most usability and UX design issues are contextual. It really depends on the thing that you're building. There are very few uh, uh, you know, uh, absolute truths in terms of usability and UX design. Um, and uh, in fact, a lot of people, the, the joke is that usability people always say it depends, which I, I kind of like. I think it's actually pretty true. Uh, and then the developer comes back with the developer's trump card, which is, we can't do that. And <laughs> if, if the person who's responsible for implementing it says we can't do that, then unless there's somebody with a higher ranking in the room, they're going to win. So it's an effective trump card. And then <laughs> <laughs> the manager, poor manager. So, um, uh, so she tries, to, you know, she's plucky, and her job is just to keep this thing moving. So she tries to get it rolling again, which is followed by the long, awkward silence which is followed two weeks later by the same discussion. So this is what I sort of knew. I knew that when I came into these situations, this discussion had been going on over and over and that it was, that it, that there were, it, 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 it uh, had no resolution. And I thought of them as religious debates because they're based on deeply held personal beliefs and nobody ever changes their mind. Okay, so that's why I thought of them that way. And the deeply held personal beliefs I realized eventually were that because these people have the jobs that they have because of who they are. So for instance, people become developers because they like complicated stuff, okay? It's, it's just true, they like complicated stuff. They like figuring out how things work, all right? They like looking at a complicated interface and figuring out how it works, reverse engineering it in their head, figuring out what they can copy from it. But it's, it, and, and the thing is, when they're doing that, there are endorphins involved. You know, and that's why they became developers, because of those endorphins. And because it's happening at the endorphin level, they're never going to change their mind. And it's going to be very hard for them to imagine that anybody else doesn't get pleasure out of that. Okay? And the same thing with designers. Designers, you know, uh, if you've got lots of hairline rules and gray on gray type um, designers, there will be endorphins released when a designer looks at it. And so it's hard for them to imagine that that's not what people like most about these online experiences. So that makes it very hard for people to find any common ground when they're trying to make those kind of decisions. Um, the, the thing is, we're, we're all users. We use this stuff ourselves, so we imagine that everybody uses it and thinks about it the same way they do, but we're not our users. We are not them. We're definitely not them. And the other thing is we don't appreciate how diverse they are. Generally speaking, it's so easy to imagine that other people look at and use this stuff the way I do. Um, but it's just not true. Once you start doing usability testing, once you start spending time living among users, you realize that it's incredibly, the use is incredibly diverse. But, you know, I, my, I like to say all use is idiosyncratic. You know, everybody's approaching with a different combination of uh, prior knowledge, you know, exactly what their goals are, what kind of situation they're in, all kinds of things are, are very different. Um, and the other thing is that it's, it's, when we're building something, it's almost impossible for us to remember that people don't know what we know. And that's kind of the biggest problem, is when you're working on something, you know too much about it. You know how it works or how it's supposed to work. And so it's hard for you to imagine somebody approaching it and trying to use it who doesn't know that. That's very hard, and that's why usability testing is so great, because it gives you a chance to watch somebody else have that experience. Right, this is uh, Lisa Reichelt, who just moved back from the UK to take over um, the government, uh, the UX basically for government sites. Good news is that um, uh, I do think that there's a, a solution for this kind of conflict between uh, team members coming at it from different directions. And I have been going around for a while now trying to teach people to do it, do their own usability testing. So, all right, what's a usability test? A usability test is incredibly simple. It's just watching people try to use what you create. So you're watching them use it. It's not a focus group where you ask people questions about things or you ask about their opinions or their prior experiences. You, ha you have, if it's a usability test, you're watching them try to use it. Even if it's a prototype, you're watching them try to use it at the same time that they think out loud so that you have access to their cognitive process while they're using it. You know what they're looking at, what they're trying to do, what they're thinking about, what's frustrating them. I always say you're looking for the question marks forming over their head. That's where you get the insights from. Um, and that's kind of it. Uh, watch them use it while they think out loud. 
So uh, we talked a little bit about this earlier. Most sites don't get tested. Everything thinks it costs a lot of money, which it, which it used to. And if you don't do it yourself, it can cost a lot of money. Uh, it takes a lot of time, uh, the time spent doing it, and the time, the, the, the time that it will add to f completing the thing. Because you have to wait for the test to be done, and then you have to go in and fix things that were found while the test was done. And as somebody said over here, failure to understand its value. So, all right, so we're going to swing into demo mode and uh, try an actual test. So uh, I'm gonna ask for a volunteer, but wait until I get through the slide first. Um, yeah, the process is painless. The nice thing about usability testing is people actually usually enjoy it and they often learn something. Uh, it's brief. In this case, it's gonna be like 10 minutes and you get a round of applause when we're done. Now, in the, you actually usability testing, you get a round of applause, but here you will. Um, but you get something. Uh, so qualifying criteria for our volunteer, you have used a web browser. I keep the standard very low. <laughs> and this was the question came up about, uh, the comment about recruiting. Recruiting is hard. Okay, you can make recruiting easier by keeping the standard very low. And we'll talk about that. That's one of the six maxims is, is keep it low. Um, so I say here, has somebody who's used a web browser, somebody, which by which I mean somebody who knows where the back button is, and somebody who knows that things that have an underline underneath them or are all the same color, if you click on them, you're likely to get another screen full of stuff. Um, that's it. That's it. Uh, English speaking adult, which only means is, is a reminder that you shouldn't do this in translation, that so much of what you're looking to learn depends on nuances of language that you actually can't have a test being conducted by somebody else and a translator uh, for, for the observers. You need a facilitator who speaks the same language as the participant, and you need some observers who speak that language too. Um, not a low talker, just for the benefit of the people in the back room, and if you know the Seinfeld notion of a low talker, so if ever people are always saying excuse me to you, then please don't volunteer. And finally, as a bonus question, not a necessity, but a bonus, somebody who hasn't used the New Zealand immigration site. Um, so uh, I'm sure there must be somebody in the room. So who would like to volunteer? And we'll keep moving right there. Yes, please come on up. Um, and now, while we get going, the rest of you are now in the role of observers. So you're going to pretend that you're sitting in a room down the hall from us. And via screen sharing, you are watching what's, what's going on on the screen and listening to our conversation um, and eating snacks. Mm -hmm. um, so. Hi, I'm Steve. Hi, I'm Tina. Tina, hi. Please sit down here. Okay. All right, so um, I'm going to read my usability test script, which is in the rocket surgery book, but don't tell anybody, you can download it for free from my website. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell my publisher I told you that. Um, <laughs> in fact, all the documents, the, 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 the checklists and forms and uh, consent forms and whatnot in, that are in the book are on the website, and you're welcome to them. Uh, just go to sensible.com, S-C-N-S-I-B-L-E.com. I actually got an English language word for my domain a um, long time ago. And uh, go to the part of the site that's for rocket surgery, the rocket surgery book, and you'll find a download link. So, so uh, I'm going to read this script. I'm going to put mm -hmm. this down. And uh, I will read it verbatim because that's what I recommend you do. I can tell you why during Q&A if you want to know. All right. Uh, hi, uh, Tina. Uh, my name is Steve, Hi. and I'm going to be walking you through this session today. Great. Um, before we begin, I have some information for you. I'm going to read it to make sure that I cover everything. Okay. You probably already have a good idea why we asked you here, but let me go over it again briefly. We would have told Tina when we recruited her in a phone call or email, whatever, basically what's going to happen. We're asking people to try to use a website that we're working on so we can see whether it works as intended. I'm going to go a little faster than usual. Um, the session should take about 15 minutes. First thing I want to make clear right away is that we're testing the site, not you. You can't do anything wrong here. In fact, there's probably the one place today where you don't have to worry about making mistakes. Okay. okay. Um, as you use the site, I'm going to ask you as much as possible to try to think out loud, to say what you're looking at, what you're trying to do, and what you're thinking. This will be a big help to us. Okay. And also, please don't worry you're going to hurt our feelings. We're doing this to improve the site, so we need to hear your honest reactions. Um, if you have any questions as we go along, just ask them. I may not be able to answer them right away since we're interested in how people do when they don't have someone sitting next to them to help. Okay. But if you still have any questions when you're done, I'll try to answer them then. And if you need to take a break at any point, just let me know. Okay. Right. You may have noticed the microphone. There would be a microphone on the desk or in the laptop. Um, with your permission, we're going to record what happens on the screen and our conversation. 
The recording will only be used to help us figure out how to improve the site, and it won't be seen by anyone except the people working on this project. Great. And it helps me because I don't have to take as many notes. Great. Also, there are a few people from the web design team observing this session in another room. They can't see us. They can't see us, just the screen. Okay, and that would be true. We wouldn't have a webcam pointing at Tina. Um, if you would, I'm going to ask you to sign a simple permission form for us. It just says we have your permission to record you, and that the recording will only be seen by the people working on the project. Okay. And that, that's what I would hand her. It basically has those two sentences on it, and so it's really easy. And then I would lean in and start a screen recorder like Camtasia, because prior to this point, we didn't have to use permission to record her. Okay. Do you have any questions so far? No. Okay. All right. Before we look at the site, I'd like to ask you just a few quick questions. First, what's your occupation? What do you do all day? I'm a business analyst. Business analyst. What, yeah. kind, of, what kind of business do you oh, I work. I work for TradeMe. Oh, okay. And what's that? I'm sorry. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. It's a, it's a, um, a website. It's like um, New Zealand's eBay. Oh, okay. Great. Um, roughly how many hours a week altogether, just a rough estimate, would you say you spend using the internet, including web browsing and email at work? Like all, every day, like, all day. Like uh, every day, all day. Yeah. So like like t eight to ten hours a day. Is that uh, eight hours? Uh, yeah. Eight hours a day. Okay. Um, what? Uh, so what kinds of sites, uh, work and or personal, are you looking at when you browse the web? What kinds of sites do you? Ah, uh, usually trade me. <laughs> okay. okay. Anything, yeah. anything else? Anything news or? Anything? Um. I'm not allowed to say Facebook, but uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you, you use it at home. That's fine. Um, do you have do you have any favorite websites? Um, like at work or outside of yeah, work? Yeah, wherever. Anything, um, anything. I like to read lots of um, like technology news sites. Okay. Yeah, like Inc.com, Fast <laughs> Company, um, HBR, that okay. kind of stuff. Great. Mm. Great. All right. So. Um, we're done with the questions, so we can start looking at things. Uh, first, I'm going to ask you to look at this page, and you can use the mouse that's there, too, if you'd rather. Oh, cool. Um, it should work. Let me take this out of the way. Um, first, I'm going to ask you cool. to look at this page and tell me what you make of it, what strikes you about it, whose site you think it is, what you think you can do here, and what it's for. Just look around and do a little narrative. You can scroll if you yep. want to, but don't click on anything just yet. Okay, cool. Um, I know it's for a website for New Zealand immigration. Um, it looks pretty modern. I like the design. Uh, it looks really straightforward, really easy. I like to come to New Zealand to visit, study, work. It's, um, you know, there's not much text on it, which is good. So what do you think you would do here? Um, kind of thing. From here, I'll probably click on one of these buttons, depending on what I was interested for. Oh, I see there's like a search box here as well, so I could... And I assume I can uh, apply for different visas or something to come to New Zealand. Oh yeah, it says enter a visa name, so yeah. Okay. All right, great. Um, so now, I'm gonna ask you to try doing a specific task. Okay. I'm gonna read it out loud and give you a printed copy. I don't have a printed copy for you, but I would give you a printed copy, okay. so I'll just read it out loud and then I'll hand it to you. Um, I'm gonna ask you to do these, this task without using search. You can use search within the site, but don't go out and use like Google okay. or something. Um, we'll learn more about how well the site works that way. And again, as much as possible, it will help us if you try to think out loud as you go along. Okay. So here's the task I'd like you to do. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you are a United States citizen with a USA passport, and you live and work in the United States. Okay. okay I want you to assume that. Your company is sending you to be a presenter at a conference in New Zealand, <laughs> and, you, and you think you may need to get a visa for the trip. Okay. Okay? Use this site to determine if you need to apply for a visa, and if you do, start the application process. So here, just in case you want to check anything, yep. there's a copy of it. So you're going to be a presenter. Yep. All right, so just go ahead and do whatever you would do. And uh, just think out loud while you're doing it. OK, so um, I'm a United States citizen with a USA passport. So um, I kind of want to just go into a search bar. Oh, no, actually. Do I want to go to visit? No, I think I'll just go into visit. Am I allowed to click? Okay, yeah? yes, please click. Okay, yes. click. Just do whatever you would do. Okay, so I'm thinking about visiting New Zealand, explore visitor visa option. I'm just going to scroll down to see if there's other options. Planning my visit, staying safe in New Zealand. 
Um, I'm just going to go back and click on that because that sounds like what I want to do. Um, so I'm thinking about visiting New Zealand. Um, there's a things to do in New Zealand, recommend trips, Vista Information Centre. Um, what are you thinking? I'm thinking that's not really what I want to know. This sounds like more like if you're going there for holiday or something. Uh, or maybe there is me, I'm not sure. Um, explore, oh no, okay, so there's a explore visitor visa option, so I think that sounds like me. Okay. So I'm going to click on that. Explore visa visa options. Visa visa allows you to come to New Zealand for a holiday, start seeing your adventure activity. Um, yeah, that sounds like me. Yeah, I'm a, I'm traveling on a passport from. Oh, okay, cool. So I can enter United States of America. That's me. That's pretty straightforward. I'm planning to stay um, less than three months. The main purpose of my visit is business or work. Cool, so that was really easy. So display options, okay. I assume that's what I'm meant to click next. Yep. Okay. Compare options that might apply to you to decide which suits you best. Okay, so there's a lot of options. Uh, but I think, it's, I think it's business, business stands out to me. Um, you can come to New Zealand for business reasons for up to three months in any one year. Okay, yeah, that sounds like me. So I'm going to click that. Okay, so this is actually comparing. So how can I actually f find information? Okay, okay, there's view, view. Cool. So what was my task again? Um, <laughs> use the site to determine if I need to apply for a visa. Okay, so business visitor visa. This visa is for you if you don't want to... If you are, if you want to come to New Zealand for business reasons, yep, that's me. Criteria you must meet, you must show that you're a genuine business visitor, okay? You must have enough money, okay? You must also have a ticket to leave, yep, that's me. Um, up to three months, yep, that's fine. What this visit, you can visit New Zealand for business. Okay, so what's considered business reasons? I'm just gonna open that in a new tab because I don't want to lose this page. Um, and that just goes back to <laughs> the page I was on okay. before, okay. All right. Uh, in the interest of time, we're going to stop there. That was perfect. It was exactly what we need. Cool. Thank you so much. That's all right. <laughs> okay. Now, I hasten to say that I did not choose the New Zealand immigration site. I chose it because I had used it because I needed to answer that same question. Um, but I didn't did not choose it because it had problems. Um, it's in fact a very good site. And once I got past the top level here, uh, I, it worked incredibly well and gave me exactly the information I needed. Uh, uh, my theory is that, there, that all immigration sites in the world, <laughs> uh, with the possible exception of the UK site because the government digital service there has been working on it and they've been doing remarkable work making things easier to use, I, ha I haven't looked at it lately, um, that they all have basically the same problems. And that the problems are not for lack of trying on the part of the people who work on them. The problem is that immigration and, and, uh, and uh, guiding people through the process of, of immigration is a wicked problem. And it's mostly made wicked by the fact that, the, that it has to present laws which are inherently complicated um, and in some ways subtle. So uh, I, I only use this because I had already used it a, a couple of times and, and it worked out quite well. Uh, other people um, had much more trouble than Tina, um, and which I, I won't go into. Um, but she actually was doing, doing fairly well, but, but she was not headed in the right direction, I can tell you that much. Uh, <laughs> And, and, and it's because that, there's that question of, do I need a business visa or, or can I get by with a visitor visa is complicated and it's complicated in all countries. Um, and it's just not easy to answer. But basically, uh, that was not about the site, it was about the process. So uh, the, the process, uh, anybody want to suggest one problem that, 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 that she ran into that if you were observing this, that you would have thought was a usability issue that you might want to deal with? Too many options. It did, it, you did have this feeling uh, when it asked if you wanted to compare options that there were a lot of options there that you could compare. 
And so there was a lot of reading to do. And in some ways, there was a lot of reading to do, but those little snippets that were there weren't really enough to tell you which options you wanted to compare. So it wasn't actually, it didn't, it didn't even work that well as a basis for choosing which ones you wanted to compare. And that's partly because it's a wicked problem. So that may not be quite the right interface to, to deal with that. Anybody else, one, one other quick one? Yes. Oh, yeah, sorry. Sorry, I'm pref preferential to the people in here because I can't see you in back, yes. It did circle back, yes, yeah. Yeah, uh, when she clicked on that. So I'm not sure whether that's a, a, a bug or um, I think I did run into that myself. So uh, in a nutshell, what I recommend for uh, do-it-self do usability testing is that for each round of testing, you test three users, not, not five users, not seven users, not eight users, three users. Um, and the reason for that is that it's, if you only test three users, obviously you don't have that much recruiting to do, which is great. And you will find, generally speaking, all the problems that you need to find, you know, as many problems as you can fix or more problems that you fi can fix by testing three users. If you test more users, you will find more problems, but the fact is you don't need to find more problems than that. You'll find, uh, you'll find very serious problems with testing just a few users, so keep it as simple as possible. You don't need a lab, you don't need two-way two -way glass, two-way mirror, whatever it's properly called. Uh, screen sharing works incredibly well now, so you just set up screen sharing in another room with a monitor so people can observe. You can record it with something like Camtasia or Screen Recorder. Um, you don't need entrance and exit questions because you're only testing three people, so there's no, there's no validity to anything statistical you could, you could gather, so there's no point in doing it. You don't need to create a big honking report. Historically, what would happen with usability testing is you'd bring in an outside consultant who would run the usability test. They would then do all the observations themselves, they'd go off and spend two weeks writing a big report, an 80-page report, to justify the fact that you were spending $10,000 to run this round of usability testing. It didn't really benefit anybody. Um, and so instead of a big honking report, what I recommend is that you debrief as a team right away after the test and draw your conclusions right away after the test about what you saw and what you're going to fix. And then the report consists of a two-page email, maximum two-page email, with, some, with a bunch of bullet lists on it that basically just says, here's what we tested, we, here's what we had available to test, this is what people were shown, and you have a link to the prototype or the part of the page, part of the website or whatever it was that they were testing so people can go and look at it for themselves if they want to. Here are the tasks we gave them to test, and here are the major, here are the worst problems that we observed that people ran into, and here's what we're going to do about them. But you do it in very simple statements as a bullet list because that's what people will be willing to read. Okay, um, send out an email. Okay, so real quickly then, so we can get the questions, the, the, the six maxims from the book. One, start earlier than you think makes sense. People always want to wait to start doing usability testing. And one of the reasons, there are a whole bunch of reasons for this, but one of them is that you always have a better version in your head than you have available to show. You always know things that you're going to fix. You always know things that you're going to improve. You just haven't had time to do them yet. So people say, well, why should we show people this version that in a week is going to be much better? Why don't we wait until it's better and then show it to them? Because if we don't, we're going to waste our time and their time having them point out problems to us that we already know exist. The problem is, that's not what you're looking for. They're going to point out to you the problems that you don't know exist because they're going to look at it differently than you are. Um, and the other thing is that the earlier you start testing, the, the sooner you discover what these problems are so that you don't build them into your product. You know, the, the longer you wait to discover these problems, the more expensive it is in time and money for you to go back and fix them. Okay, and sometimes they become unfixable if you don't discover them and too late in the process. So earlier is always better. Um, this is, was my flow chart for how people think about it. Um, uh, if it's finished, okay, start testing. And my, the way I think you should think about it, are you working on it? Yes, you should start testing as soon as you start working on it, in some ways even before. All right, you can things you can test, you can test almost anything. If you're redesigning something, you should test the old one. Um, if you haven't even started designing, one of the best things you can do is test competitors' products uh, or, or uh, comparable products, people who are do, trying to do the same kind of thing you are. There's absolutely nothing ethically wrong about doing a usability test on somebody else's website. Um, I always say they, they basically, they, they, they worked out a com completely uh, flushed out, flushed out um, uh, version of a design approach to the problem that you're going to be trying to solve. 
and they left the keys in the car. And since there's no reason not to do it, you can learn an enormous amount just by having a few people do the tasks on somebody else's site. So that's actually a very good way to start. You can test a sketch on a napkin. You have a sketch on a napkin. Basically, take it to, take it to a couple of people and say, tell me what you think this is. Describe, do this like I did with the narrative of the home page. Tell me what you think this is for and what you do here. And they'll say, well, it looks like you're selling like copies of research papers and I guess over here you could search for them and here you could order them and blah, blah, blah. And if what they describe is what you're trying to do, then get a bigger napkin and keep going. But odds are, when you show them a sketch on a napkin, they will reveal something to you that you did not think of. Okay, and it's an incredibly cheap and dirty way to, to find that out. Wireframes, obviously people have done forever. Prototypes, much more popular now, whether they're in balsamic or they're actually built in a framework. Prototypes, page comps. Um, you don't have to have a whole thing built. You can have portions, like you have what they call a garden path, where you just have the pages where if people click on the right things, they will go to that succession of pages. Um, and if you have the garden path built, then you can test with that. And if somebody clicks off the garden path, then it just brings up a little screen that says this part of the prototype has not been built or whatever. So, um, and obviously you can keep testing all the way, all the way through development. Um, my proposal for how often you should test and, and when is a morning a month. Uh, I recommend that you pick uh, and, and obviously this is not an agile version of this. If it's an agile version, then it's a whole different story and it's whether it's once a sprint or whatever, we can talk about it later. But, but basically, if you're not working in agile, I recommend that you pick one morning a month. There's an agency in the US government that the woman who took this up and started doing what she called uh, uh, third Thursdays. And so the third Thursday of every month was testing day. And on the morning of the third Thursday, they would have recruited three people to come in and they would test basically whatever they had available to test at that point. Now part of the beauty, there are two things I really like about this. One is, um, if you say we're just gonna do it once a month, then that's pretty doable. Almost everybody can devote one morning a month to doing user experience design, usability testing. Um, two, it unhinges it from, or decouples it from deliverables. So traditionally, you would schedule usability testing based on when you were going to have a particular de deliverable. We'll have a prototype on this date. Okay, we'll do usability testing that week. Or we're going to have, have alpha on this date. We'll, we'll do usability testing that week. Never worked out because the stuff was never on time. And so it was hard to plan the usability testing. The deliverable would slip. The usability testing would slip and never get done. So if you just say, okay, every, every, on this day, every month, we're going to do usability testing with whatever we have available that's in reasonable shape for us to test then you, it makes it much easier to keep doing it. It gives you one less excuse. Recruit loosely and grade on a curve I talked about earlier in terms of keeping the bar really low. People historically, when you start saying we're going to do usability testing, everybody starts saying, well, where are you going to get people? You're going to get people from our target audience, right? You're going to get people from our target audience, right? You're going to do that. It, depending on what your target audience is, it can be hard to get them. Depend, so, and in point of fact, when, particularly when you're first starting to do usability testing, you don't need people from your target audience. You can take people who are not and feed them some of the domain knowledge hints that they need. And it works perfectly well. Because in the beginning, the problems that are built into your stuff are so gross that anybody is going to run into them. They don't have to have domain knowledge. It works really well. Okay, make it a spectator sport. This is probably my favorite. Uh, what it means is if you want real value out of this, Get people to come and watch your monthly usability tests, which is another reason for only doing them once a month. Everybody knows third Thursday is usability morning. Okay, So what you want to do is gather as many people as you can possibly get to come and watch one or all three of these sessions um, sit in the room and watch them together. And what that does is, so I'm talking everybody. I'm talking from C-level people to stakeholders to developers to designers, everybody who has an interest in it. And the more you can get people to come and watch some of these, the more they have a, develop a shared experience of seeing people actually try and use the thing that you're building. And they learn a lot about who the audience is and how people are going to use this uh, and whether your approach is working or not. Uh, they get to share those experiences in the, in the conference, in the uh, observation room, and they get to take part in the debriefing right, right after it. Um, I, the most important thing in this illustration is the plate of donuts in the middle of the table. Uh, I say if you want to get people to come, the best thing you can do is provide the best snacks that you can. So provide some snacks that no other uh, department in your company provides. Get the $4 
chocolate croissants or the bottles of Fiji water or whatever. If you're going to spend any money, spend it on snacks. People want to come. Okay. Focus ruthlessly on a small number of the most important problems. Well, um, the problem is that, as I said earlier, usability testing uncovers a lot of problems in a hurry. Okay. And it can be, and it's not so much that it's overwhelming, it's that you can, it's very easy to find more problems then you actually have the resources to fix. You probably don't, can't allocate that many resources to fixing usability problems. And there is the, the, the low-hanging fruit problem. Supposing your, te your usability test uncovers 20 problems that the developer realizes they can solve them in one minute each, and their performance review is coming up in two weeks. Are they going to tackle those, or are they going to tackle the one problem that everybody ran into that's really serious, but that may be kind of intractable? Okay. And, and may not pay off. Um, there's a great tendency to, to head for low-hanging fruit, and so you've really got to focus on the most serious problems. Otherwise, they'll just persist, and you'll end up, it, when things finally build, it will still have these serious problems because nobody, nobody wants to put the, the time in to tackle them. Um, uh, I, f I try and head this off by giving people uh, a form uh, f to use it in the observation room so that each observer is told that this is the form they're supposed to use to capture their feedback for the debriefing. They can keep any notes they want. They can write down thousands of usability things that they, that they notice. But at the end of each session, at the end of each participant session, they have to write down the three most serious problems that they observed during that session before they forget them. And this page with these nine, nine problems on it is what they bring into the debriefing session. And when they go into the debriefing session, they have to pick three out of those nine to, to give to the group. And that tends to focus it on, on the most serious things. Okay. And finally, since we're uh, focusing on these serious problems, you're not always going to be able to fix these serious problems, at least perfectly. And there's a real temptation to say, we got to fix it perfectly. Okay, we, we saw this problem with search. Well, we could redesign search. If we redesign search, then that problem would go away, along with a lot of other problems. You don't have the capacity to redesign search most of the time. So what you want to do is tweak instead of redesigning. Okay, so you, you're, you're, you should always be thinking, we just observed a serious problem. What's the smallest change we can make that might solve that observed problem? Okay, rather than going in and making it perfect, what's the smallest change that we can make right now that would eliminate that for most people as a serious problem? And then make that change, you know? And then it's done, it's done right away. It may not, it won't be perfect, but it, it's much better than waiting for a perfect solution. So I'm gonna skip past these. This is my list of nine reasons why tweaking is better than redesigning. My favorite is the last one, which is a redesign mean, you know, means involving a lot of people in a lot of meetings. Okay. Enough said. So, all right. And I'm done with my slides except for these four tips. One is if you or anyone you know works on writing or editing uh, for the web, they sh if they don't have this book, buy it for them. They will be intensely grateful to you. It's called Letting Go of the Words. It's by a woman named Ginny Reddish. Um, and it's a fabulous book about writing or editing for the web. Um, I also happen to like Laura Klein's book, UX for Lean Startups. Uh, it's very thin. I think it's still only in hardcover. Um, but it's, it's a really good book about doing UX in a hurry. And uh, remote testing. If you haven't done remote testing, same thing as what we just did here, except we wouldn't be in the same place. We'd just be using go to meeting or, or WebEx or some kind of screen sharing, Tina would be at home, and we do, but we do exactly the same thing. Um, the only thing you miss out on is you're not sitting next to the person, so you may miss some body language, but it turns out it's not that important if you have good audio. So don't use a speakerphone, use voice over IP uh, built into the screen sharing, you know, go to meeting or whatever, uh, so you have high quality audio, and then you'll be able to tell what they're thinking. Um, the only caveat about that is you shouldn't start off by doing remote testing. You want to do a bunch of in-person, like maybe eight or nine in-person tests so that you really have the process under your belt. Because the one thing that is true about the remote testing is you have to pay really close attention. And you, because you may not know whether they, they fell silent because they're thinking about something or they fell silent because their dog just came into the room and they're petting their dog. So, so you have to be capable of paying really close attention. And also um, unmod remote unmoderated testing, which is um, things like usertesting.com. Anybody know usertesting.com? It's basically a service. You send them a URL and you send them the task. And you say how many people you want to have perform that task. They put it out to their pool of testers. 
who then record with a webcam, uh, record a, a, do, go in and do the task and record a, a think aloud while they're doing it, and then you get the video and you can play it back. The biggest uh, beauty of that is uh, you can get the video back in like an hour. So if you have something quick and dirty that you want to test, it's a, re it's a, a really good way to do it. Um, this is a boxfish because many people I know, anybody ever seen a boxfish? Yeah, most people, they're, they're really cool, right? They're like really cool. So a boxfish, <laughs> I put this slide in because most people have never seen a boxfish. And they're as if you took a ping pong ball and put it in a press to make it into a cube. And then you glued an adorable nose to the front and an adorable tail to the back. They really are. They're really cubic, and they're they're just just wonderful to see. So I don't know if the, if any aquarium aquarium aquarii um, in New Zealand have boxfish, but I highly recommend them. And um, I would be happy to hear from you and take questions now.